Welcome everyone to ISIS Parenting Sleep Webinar and Chat. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm a mom and baby nurse educator, board certified lactation consultant, and board certified in pediatrics. I'm the vice president of clinical content and online learning here at ISIS Parenting. I'm at our home office outside of Boston, Massachusetts. We have four centers located in the greater Boston area. We have five new centers located in the Dallas and Fort Worth area, and we've just opened four new centers in the Atlanta, Georgia area. So I hope that if you or your friends or family are located in one of those areas, you please help spread the word and uh, let people know that they can actually come to our centers and take classes and uh, interact. And today is an exciting topic for many people. We're going to talk specifically about twins. And even if you are not the parent of twins, you will still find plenty of good sleep information today. But uh, parents of twins do have some very particular and unique scenarios, and they've got lots of questions about them. And we have no one better than my friend and colleague, Meg Cassano, one of our two twin specialists on the ISIS Parenting Sleep Team, to demystify some of the biggest concerns about twins. Welcome, Meg. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks for joining everyone. Um, I first just have to start by saying that those of you who have twins, I, I give you so much credit. It's, you know, it's, it's wonderful. It's, you know, it's such a blessing, but you do have, you do have it harder in a lot of ways when it comes to sleep than your friends. So if that makes you feel any better, <laughs> um, you all who, you know, you who have twins here in the chat room today, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, it, it really is a great thing. I actually am a twin myself and I'm, you know, I'm just so happy that I am. Some of my most favorite moments and my most precious memories of my twin sister are um, when we shared a room and we were falling asleep together and, and um, you know, talking a little bit. And so I really felt so strongly that even though I don't have twins, I really wanted my kids to share a room um, so they could have that experience too, falling asleep at night. So... That's my little note. Yep, I, I am I am a twin. <laughs> um, okay, so as we get into this, and you can just ooh and ah over these just, I mean, it's doubly cute. I mean, one baby is cute, but it's so true that two are especially cute. So um, look at all these beautiful pictures. Um, and, you know, we just wanted to give you a reminder that even though you have two, all the basics of good sleep, instilling good sleep, sleep hygiene, um, still apply to twins. <laughs> um, so if you're having a problem and you're thinking you need to make a change, um, you, you're still going to be carefully looking and making sure you're asking your child to be on an age-appropriate schedule. Um, I have found in my experience um, with um, twin families, and I also have twin nieces, um, I have found that because you're so busy during the day, sometimes there's a rush, like, oh my gosh, let's put them down. I need to put these babies to bed already. Um, sometimes there's a tendency to over nap, over nap, oversleep twins. I'm not saying all the time. I'm just saying just be careful. Um, you want to make sure that as your baby's growing, as she's coming out of the, you know, if, if your baby was premature, as they're coming out of the, the prematurity phase, um, do you make sure you're getting them on age-appropriate schedules? We've got webinars um, for all of those, whether you have um, a, a young baby, a little bit older baby, or, a to or toddler twins, uh, make sure that schedule is appropriate. Uh, make sure that you are allowing their circadian rhythms to be nice and regular. 30-minute um, windows, we're looking for about a 30-minute window day-to-day -day at bedtime and about a 30-minute window day-to-day -day morning wake-up time. Um, of course, I always say, you know, there's a catch always to that, that if your baby has had a particularly um, awful napping day for some reason, um, yes, they get to go to bed earlier, absolutely. But in general, you're, you're keeping um, regularity. Again, we've got webinars on all of the, you know, all the nuts and bolts of exactly what the circadian rhythm does, why it needs regularity. Um, but you also make sure you've got um, nice and dark rooms for sleep. This this nap this room looks um, looks good. Pretty looks like it's too dark to read. Looks like there might be a nightlight down there in the corner. Um, nightlights can be fine. Just make sure they're dim. 
um, not shining right into a baby's crib, um, and you know, stay away from bright colored like bright blue, bright green. Stick more to orangey or ambery color lights. Um, and then, of course, when babies are up and playing, it's um, bright lights on in your house, a little outdoor, natural sunlight exposure. That's always helpful for sleep. Okay, um, same thing as, you know, still just hitting some of the basics. You want cool rooms, quiet rooms. Um, you don't want your babies over bundled. These, <laughs> these little ones certainly aren't over bundled. How cute is that? Um, and you want to be using continuous white noise. When you have twins sharing a room or siblings sharing a room, a continuous white noise machine is, is almost essential, I'd say. Um, you know, particularly during the, the times of the night and during nap time when your babies, your twins, are going to be in um, lighter sleep, where they're going to be more easily arousable from a noise. So if one does a little cough or a little hiccup or a little cry out in their REM sleep, which happens, um, it's less likely to disturb the other. So um, definitely you're using a continuous white noise machine it's one that stays on um, for the duration of the nap or for the whole night. It's not going to shut off um, on a timer. You don't want anything to change in, um, in, in your twin's environment in the overnight or during a nap. Oh, how cute. <laughs> and we paused for a little um, delicious twin photo. I was bouncing them on the exercise ball and they fell asleep all cuddled. But this is what I mean, you twin moms. It's harder to hold two babies than it is to hold one, um, for sure. But this is so cute. Okay, so when you've established the basics and you sort of said to yourself, okay, well, you know, I, I'm, I've got the sleep schedule, I've got the great sleep environment, it's cool, it's dark, it's quiet, I've got the white noise machine, um, maybe still having some troubles, now what? And this is where I said, you know, it is harder for twins. It's all about logistics, 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 logistics. Um, I, I often get asked in sleep consults, if twins should be on the same schedule. And, you know, I mean, certainly you don't have to, but the rea you know, reality for most people is that, yes, same schedule will probably be most helpful. I mean, if you have, if you're, have the type of care environment where you can have one adult um, managing one infant and you can, um, you know, be having them do their own thing at their own time at their own pace all day, great. <laughs> um, but for most people, um, really same schedule. And, um, you know, the, the circadian rhythm can help you with that. It, the circadian rhythm is the body clock. And so if your twins are used to falling asleep around the same time each night, um, it's going to be easier for you to know when to ask them to fall asleep in, say, a new way. Like if you're trying to make a change with your babies, teach them to fall asleep in a new way, for example. Um, but with the circadian rhythm, you know, in, in you're, it's going to be a little more forgiving at bedtime than at wake time. So as your twins grow, let's say they have slightly different sleep needs. Um, one might need a little bit longer night than another, or one might need a little bit longer nap than another. It's going to be easier for you to actually put one down earlier than the other. Um, it's much harder for one twin to sleep in later past the other, um, because again, the, the nap sleep is more REM sleep, it's lighter sleep. Um, once they get awakened, um, you know, after any any length of nap, it's it's very difficult to go back to sleep. The the sleep pressure is lower. Same thing with morning. The sleep drive is low. Different type of sleep. So, um, you know, the circadian rhythm can can help you with that predictability. Um, but if you do have to deviate a little bit, it's going to be easier if you deviate at the onset of the nap or the onset of the night. Um, as you are thinking about your twins, um, your twin schedules, and, and a lot of twin moms really say, you know, hey, my baby girl just seems like she needs more sleep than my boy or the other way around. Um, if, if that's the case, and that's fine because they are individuals too, um, kind of the rule of thumb is, is if one starts to sleep 20 to 30 minutes past the other, um, now their schedules are going to start to deviate. So you, sometimes you can split the difference, you know, maybe one twin goes down a little bit earlier and she gets up a little later and you can still keep, keep the babies on roughly the same schedule. 
Um, but so I guess what I'm saying is, <laughs> yes, it's okay to wake your sleeping twin um, if needed to help protect the regularity of your schedule. Um, you know, I know sometimes just for your sanity, if if they're napping all day long, one, you know, one after the other, then it's, it's hard to be able to go, you know, go out, get, you know, do anything and, and feel like you can, um, you know, be a part of the world. So, um, it is okay for you to wake a sleeping baby, um, if it helps you keep their schedules in sync. And just remember that, you know, if one needs to sleep a little more than, than another, that's fine. 20 minutes or so, once you start getting up to 30 minutes and more, that's when the schedules start to desynchronize, that the circadian rhythm doesn't handle shifts greater than 30 minutes all that well. So try to keep them within about a 30 minute window. And you know, so it's it's perfectly fine if one baby goes down a little earlier than the other, um, that, that happens and that is actually, um, that, that's actually totally fine. More acute photos. I wonder if these are the same babies with the diaper covers on their tummies, <laughs> the nudie ones, they're so cute. Okay. Um, so logistics with twins and feeding. So um, a lot of I get a lot of questions about feedings and um, you know how that relates to bedtime, bedtime routine in the middle of the night. Um, and so you know the first thing to sort of pull out of this is feeding at bedtime. Um, twins or not, it's actually often a, a great um, a great idea to separate your feeding from you're actually falling asleep. So if you're having trouble, your twins are waking up all the time, if they have a bottle or breastfeeding sleep association to fall asleep, um, you wanna see if you can move that feeding a little farther away from the actual fall asleep time. Um, you might be um, nursing or breastfeeding or bottle feeding or doing a combination of both. Um, you might do that about half an hour before bedtime in a place that's not super sleep promoting, like maybe on a couch in the living room with the lights on. Um, and then you move in with your twins to um, more of your bedtime routine kind of stuff. Um, some parents at that point then like to sort of split a little bit. Um, maybe one, one baby chills in a bouncy chair and the other baby gets just a last little bonus nursing session, just that one-on-one -on -one snuggle time. It doesn't have to be long, it could just be a few minutes, um, but just that kind of comfort, that, that snuggle nursing, and um, one baby gets ready to go into the crib and then it's the next baby's turn. Sometimes things like that happen. Um, Sometimes if another caregiver is home, um, you know, mom might be nursing and caregiver might be giving a bottle or vice versa. Um, some twins are supplemented. I know twin families where one twin is breastfed and one twin is bottle fed. So, um, you know, really there are a lot of different ways that, that this works for twins. Um, I know Nancy mentioned there are a lot of um, questions about this, so we'll try to come back. I'll, I'll try to touch um, more specifically on, um, on your particular questions about this. But um, both twins do get good feeding before bedtime. It's helpful if, um, if the feeding is, is not the very last thing. And then um, in the middle of the night, um, Okay, Nancy's, Nancy's cueing me, waking to feed. Um, yeah, okay, so in the middle of the night, the question is, what happens if, you know, one baby is waking more than the other? Are you, are you going to go by the philosophy of, you know, well, one up, both up, because otherwise, you know, I'll be up all night, every two hours, feeding twins. Um, so I usually recommend... Get, you know, give yourself a little bit of time to figure out a pattern. I mean, one night, one bad night where one baby wakes up and then an hour and a half later the next baby's up and then an hour and a half later the first baby was up. So, you know, give yourself enough time to determine a pattern. Sometimes one twin will truly be, you know, a more solid sleeper overnight and will sleep through that first feeding and both twins will eat together at the second feeding. So one twin could be having two feedings a night and the other twin could be having one feeding a night. Um, and, and that's fine. If that's the way it's truly working, you do not have to wake the, you know, baby A at the first feeding with baby B 
And then you can feed them both together at the second feeding. Okay, that's kind of probably an easy answer. Um, I think, you know, sometimes the question comes up more that, um, well, you know, what do I do if it's, if it's you know, like 2 o'clock in the morning and I know one baby needs to eat, but I know that two hours later the other baby's going to wake up to eat too. Um, so if, if your twins are on kind of a, you know, like a one feeding night, a night, but they're not really lining up, um, there are a couple things you can do. Um, yeah, you could you could wake one. You could sort of you know just scoop up the sleeping baby and feed her. And if that works, and both twins eat well and they go back to sleep for the rest of the night, that is not a problem. It's okay um, to do that. Again, you know, in in this case, it's more about the whole reality of of life and and your situation with twins. Um, you as mom um, or dad or caregiver, you know, you can't be waking up every ninety minutes to do feeding. So sometimes you do have to um, sort of manage them a little bit. Um, the other thing you could do if if one twin is waking up what seems like a little prematurely, um, like for example, maybe one of your twins is popping up at one and your other one is making it solidly till three and and both are the same weight and developmentally things are going fine. The pediatrician says no, they're good to go. Um, you might be in a position of wanting to wean down the one o'clock feeding with one twin and sort of transferring that feeding later into the 3 a.m. so that both babies are eating at the same time. So you're in a situation of shuffling around feedings in some cases. Um, if you do do that, remember, yeah, Nancy said you always want to um, gently reduce night feedings. You don't stop them cold turkey. Uh, so, so that you know, you're, you're just transferring calories into a more desirable time of the night for you. Okay, so, you know, really the answer is do, <laughs> it's okay, yes, I'm giving you permission, it is okay to wake up a sleeping baby to feed her um, if you know that it, you know, if, if you don't do it, if she's going to just end up waking up, you know, 90 minutes later and now you're hardly sleeping. Well, we can come back to that a little bit more too. Um, you know, sometimes logistics with twins make it hard too. Some sometimes, um, you know, motor milestones are accomplished at different paces. Um, one starts rolling, and the other is not ready. One has a greater greater startle reflex, and the other doesn't. And so it's it's okay. You know, just just remember they're individuals too. And um, if one needs to come out of the swaddle before the other, that's okay. Um, if one starts slipping over and wanting to sleep on his tummy and the other doesn't, you know, that's okay too. Um, caloric needs some babies, like I said, one twin might need to eat twice in the night, while the other really only needs to eat once. And so then it's really more um, logistics of how to map out those feedings so it's not like one, two, three, you know, um, three feedings in a night between two babies, so it's really, um, you know, just two feedings in the night. And then general sleep needs, I mean, we, we know ranges, you know, babies and, and toddlers do average ranges of sleep um, in the overnight, you know, typically, depending on the age, 10 and a half to 12. Um, one twin might be a little on the lower end of that and one might be a little on the higher. So um, make sure you allow for that. And if one needs to go to bed on a regular basis, you know, 20 or even 30 minutes earlier than the other, that's fine. Um, same with a nap, that you're going to have more wiggle room at bedtime again than you will um, with thinking one will sleep in extra in the morning. Okay, and then um, we commonly get questions about um, sleep location and should twins share a crib. And although these photos are incredibly cute and obviously these babies were being observed because parents were taking pictures, um, the AAP does not recommend crib or bassinet sharing um, and there's no evidence of, of benefit um, in preemies, which is a common, um, a common thought. So cute. Okay, and then another big question is um, should your twins share a room? And nighttime, you know, my answer is parents' choice. I mean, you know, because what I said in the very beginning, I personally love it. I think it's great. I think it's great for siblings in general to share a room. Um, but certainly they don't have to. And, um, you know, will they wake each other? Yeah, they probably will. <laughs> That's one of, the, one of the challenges with siblings or twins um, who do share a room. Um, yes, they will probably wake each other from time to time. 
Um, the first half of the night will be less likely when they're particularly the first third of the night when they're doing deeper sleep. Um, last third of the night will be much more likely and this goes for toddlers too. The last third of the night is more tricky and so, you know, sometimes until your baby's in a really regular pattern, you know, at, which can be um, after, you know, six months or so, um, some parents do choose to separate their twins at night until things are really predictable. Um, but, you know, honestly, it's, you know that it's going to happen. Um, you just want to sort of embrace the fact going into it that this is one of the challenges might might occur from time to time. Um, if you find yourself in a position of doing any sleep interventions, meaning you need to make a change or improvement, or you find they're just waking each other up at every little peep and you really want them to learn how to um, go back to sleep when that happens, and you do a sleep intervention, um, you know, we, we're going to talk about what, you know, what that could look like as well, but um, yes, it's fine if you keep them together. For nap time, nap time is a little bit different. Um, the sleep pressure is lower. It's a different type of sleep. Um, and so sometimes it is actually beneficial for twins to actually be separated for nap. Um, if you're finding that they really, really seem to be waking up each other. And, and again, sometimes it's just a temporary thing. Sometimes, well, you know, if you're in a big period of nap transition, like between four and a half to six months, while well, naps are really sorting themselves out, they might just be separated for six or eight weeks or so. And then when naps are, um, you know, really improved, really steady, they come back together. Um, so, you know, things like that happen. If one twin is a shorter napper and he pops up and he's jumping around his crib and happily calling for mommy and it's waking the other one up consistently, you know, again, might be another reason to, to separate for nap time because once the other child gets awakened in the early morning or at nap time, it's very hard to go back to sleep because of the type of sleep and the lower sleep pressure. Okay, now, so sleep intervention. towards more consolidated sleep, improved sleep. If you'd like to change a sleep association that's waking your child frequently, like rocking or nursing or bottling or pacifier, you know, if, if your child has a sleep association that's that's causing them to wake at every sleep cycle, um, it might be time for change. And you would do, um, you know, any one of a number of sleep interventions um, to to to, to and you know to, to do your change but um, and we have webinars recorded on these we have you know a, a bit of a slower style sleep intervention um, a trading down sleep associations sort of a, a gentle transition um, sort of leveling down from say nursing to holding to crib side soothing to moving out the door um, and then we have a little bit of a faster pace more of a check-in or interval style um, but please know that those are just two examples. There are many other ways, in-room strategies, out-of-room strategies, um, many other ways to um, accomplish the same thing. And in a sleep consult, we often take into consideration, you know, temperament, logistics of the family, um, parenting style, and really help you find the best fit. Um, but any sleep intervention starts with the bedtime routine. And you know, for twins, this again can be um, can be tricky because it's hard. You, you know, it's only um, unless you have two parents or two caregivers all the time doing the bedtime routine. Um, it's almost a guarantee that you're going to have to have an age appropriate safe spot to put one <laughs> while you're doing some sort of um, you know care with the other. So uh, a seat, a swing, an activity mat, a pack and play. Um, you know, if they're not moving around, it might even just be a blanket on the floor, but just some safe place in earshot and eye shot where you can be keeping an eye on one twin if you have to be interacting with the other. Um, I, I typically think that it's more convenient, parents find it more convenient if you're doing things like bathing, um, oral care, you know, you're kind of doing those things at the same time. Um, but then at the end, if you want to spend those last 10 minutes or so and sort of do one, you know, have, have one twin be, have that time with, with, 
you know, one parent, um, you know, you probably wouldn't get more than 10 to 15 minutes before you'd have to intervene with the other twin. Um, but sometimes it's nice to actually split at the end. Um, although you see, um, Kara's husband is managing this quite nicely, reading um, both babies a book there. Um, you know, but you can, it's perfectly fine if you want to take one twin in your lap, you're keeping an eye on the other one, and um, do a snuggle, do another, you know, a comfort nursing or a snuggle bottle, um, do some lullabies or a book, um, and then you would do the same with the next twin. If you are feeling like, well, that sounds great, Meg, but, you know, if I do that with one twin and then place her in the crib and go get her brother, she's going to start just to cry, and there goes our nice bedtime routine. <laughs> and that happens. So it, it, you might build up to that. Um, if, if that is happening, then it, you might actually find it, it helpful um, to do the bedtime routines together. And if it's just logistically challenging to be holding them on your lap, reading a book. You might even get both of them up in your arms, walk around the room, look at some pictures in the room, um, say goodnight to familiar objects. Um, I know there's a mom with, with two-year-old twins who is listening too. And um, we have bedtime routine webinars too for toddlers. And um, so making sure that you're doing things that are developmentally appropriate for the age. Um, so that your baby is kind of interested in what you're doing. And so if, if you're doing, whether you're doing together or whether you're doing separate, when you're beginning a sleep intervention, both babies would be placed into their cribs awake. Now, of course, I'm assuming a sleep intervention that is is that the family goal is the crib but of course you know some family for some families that's not the goal um so you know in this example it would be the crib um and you know then <laughs> as you are beginning your work with your babies you're thinking about if you're, you know, going to have man-to-man -man or zone with caregivers. Like, is it, you know, just you and two babies? Or is it going to be one caregiver with one baby? And you want to think, too, you know, if you're going to be starting an intervention with your twins, uh, maybe on the first night you have an extra set of hands to do it. But is that really the way it's going to be, you know, for the next week or two weeks or three weeks or whatever, um, you know, whatever type of method you're beginning? You want to just think realistically um, what you'll be able to provide for the twins as you go through the course of your intervention. Um, when you're picking a sleep intervention, choose a method that you can physically accomplish. And if you really like the idea of something that's very gentle and soothing and making gradual transitions, um, it, it really might almost be essential that you have another set of hands helping you accomplish that. Um, if your goal is to have your babies um, happy <laughs> at all times as you're trying to um, make some changes. For other parents, they feel okay just being in the room with the baby and they can be cycling back and forth between each baby's crib or sometimes the cribs are close enough that you can actually be touching both babies at the same time. And so for some parents, they feel that, you know, as long as I'm in the room with both babies, I'm okay with putting one down and then responding to another. Um, so that can work really nicely too. Um, and then, of course, out-of-room strategies, like an interval style coming in and out of a room to check on a baby, um, you would have to, you know, just you'd go to one baby first and then the next baby next, and then you'd go back out of the room. So really, you know, depending on your your priority when it comes to making a change, um, there are a lot of options for, for you with twins in room, out of room. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's really thinking about um, if what your priority is and if you need to have an extra caregiver with you to help accomplish that. Um, I always say don't be too hard on yourself, really. Um, one parent, two babies, there's, there's only so much you can do. And just reassure yourself for the fact that they have each other. And so sometimes if you're not able to be right there every second, um, they have what other newborn babies and, and little babies don't have. They have a constant companion and playmate. Um, and it's really wonderful, trust me. I, as a twin, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and then as you are, um, as you're going through your intervention with twins and, and beginning on, you know, some sort of structured technique to help make a change, um, you know, parents are always asking, well, 
Are they going to wake each other? <laughs> Is one going to wake the other? Again, yes, they probably will. You're going to just embrace that fact. And if one wakes the other, now you're responding to two babies. And that's okay. They're going to sort it out. They're going to figure it out. Um, yes, sometimes it takes twins longer than a singleton to fall back asleep in the middle of the night if they're kind of revving each other up. Um, but, you know, it, it, it will get better. And, um, and you can keep them together as you're doing an intervention. Okay, and our final word about twins and siblings, of course, yes, treat them as the individuals they are. <laughs> um, please, you know, in sleep expectations, sleep durations, um, responses to strategies, meaning um, what, what um, the intervention strategy that works well for one twin might not be the best um, fix for the other twin. And um, for, for toddler twins, I always say too, um, when, if you're setting up some sort of reward system for improvements, it is really important that you, um, you, know, you, you really are rewarding the behavior that you, that you saw in, in one particular child. I, you know, if you feel like, oh, if one's getting a reward, the, the other one has to get a reward, even if he didn't change the behavior. Um, then that will set you up for, um, you know, the, for not seeing the, actually not seeing the improvement that you're hoping to. <laughs> and yes, yes, I don't know if you guys can guess, this is tricky. <laughs> this is my twin sister and me, we were um, four pounds, this is when I was about four pounds. I'll tell you which one I am. I'm in the one in blue. I was always in blue. My sister was always in pink. <laughs> oh, and here's another one. Oh, yeah, and see? This is... Uh, and I... Oh, see? Now you can't tell. I'm the one on the right. I'm feeding my sister, Kate. <laughs> and then I said, oh, classic my mom. I have a china plate and a silver cup. That is so my mom, if you need my mom. <laughs> And yes, um, I did, I have a twin family in Australia, actually, who I have been chit-chatting with. And, um, you know, I know, I'm sure those of you with twins here listening, you're probably like, uh-huh, uh-huh, tell me something I don't know. I know how hard it is at bedtime. I'm living it every day. And, um, oh yeah, that's Larissa's boys right there. And so, you know, I, I know sometimes really, like if, if you're really having trouble, really the, the sleep consult is the way to go to really pull out exactly what the issue is, um, working it together with your twins and, and your family and your lifestyle and really, you know, kind of puzzling it together. Because that, that's what I feel like it really can be. It's like a puzzle sometimes and um, it's fun. Oh, so cute. Janet, your little guys have, like, the coolest gear. <laughs> their blankets, their clothes. So sleep consults. If you'd like a sleep consult, we are happy to help. Nancy, did you? Oh, oh so cute. Yeah. Could you could you tell that I just had to make like extra so slides? <laughs> There's like five concluding slides because I just had so many awesome pictures. I just couldn't help it. Um, okay, I think we better do just one question and then wrap because it's late. And um, several of the common questions we answered or hope, tried to during, there were so many questions about, do you try to get them on the same sleep routine? What about the nighttime feeds? And I think you covered those in a general way and anything more specific really would be a consult because it, it needs to depend on the unique situation. Um, but I thought this was a great question from Janet. At what age do you notice room sharing benefits begin? really begin? We're committed to room sharing but now it seems like they wake each other more than they comfort each other so if a family had the option which not all families do but if a family has the option of having the twins in two separate rooms or you know keeping one room one baby in the parents room and then the other baby uh, in the nursery to help one baby learn to sleep better or something like that when is yeah it, okay when is that's it, a, yeah that's a good question so 
let me say first that if it's if it's not an option, like like let's say a family who has a two year old and then a newborn, and they're like, tell me how fast can I get the newborn in with my two year old? Um, usually, if at all possible, I recommend until at least six months before before a newborn would go in with a sibling, at least. Um, because generally before that time, sleep is still very irregular. You don't have the full night consistency expectation, and so wake-ups are going to happen. Um, after six months, really, you know, predictability of the schedule, really the full 24-hour schedule is really doable. And so baby sharing, you know, again, yes, from time to time, they might wake each other. You might have to, um, you know, you might have to separate if one's going through something like teething or has a cold or illness you might separate them from time to time as they go through things but in general they can stay together just fine um, the the kind of social like taking comfort in each other kind of benefits um, those do tend to come a little older um, toddlerhood different for different babies uh, might be 18 months maybe two um, you know might even be a little older and I know like I'm sure the the mom with the two and a half year old twins is probably like yeah, they're jumping all over each other. They're in and out of each other's beds. So there's there's that side too. But that you can work with. <laughs> that that you can um, you know you can mold with some behavior techniques and and rewarding and stuff like that. Uh, but you know in in the end, I think establishing it early is is great um, because they do really get used to being together. It feels very natural. Um, they get used to sleeping through the little bumps in the night. Um, you know, so I guess, I don't know, Nancy, if, there, if there's like a real right answer, um, at six months minimum, my, I don't have twins, but I do have four kids very close together. My two older ones started sharing a room um, when the little one was 14 months. My two little ones started sharing a room when the little one was about one. So I waited until they're about 12 or 14 months before combining them. Yes, I agree. I don't think that there is a correct answer. Um, and I think it's by situation and by convenience. Um, uh, I saw Sally's picture. Uh, I'll go back to these the images from the nurseries. And um, Sally has the, the pack and plays or the porta cribs in the parents' room. Probably maybe she's got cribs in the other, or at some point maybe she'll wow. move one or both into the other room. Actually, I think she's got like 19 kids, so I'm not sure what she's going to do. Um, okay, five, I think. Um, pretty and pretty awesome breastfeeding babies too. Um, and then Lexi's got this beautiful dinosaur nursery set up. And um, you know, I think that obviously having having the the twins share a room um, is convenient. You need one changing table and, you know, the toys and a big pile and whatever. Um, and I think that they do grow up with each other intimately um, from, you know, from conception onward. So uh, they do need to get used to each other's sounds and presence. And that's why um, the, the co-bedding thing, the putting them in the same bassinet or the same crib, it does it intuition wise it seems like it would be a good thing but safety wise it's not um you know it's in terms of suffocation hazards and so on uh so when you're observing them yes but um otherwise really they should be on separate sleep surfaces and then once they're mobile they're going to be kicking each other in the head and so on so it doesn't really make sense um I just don't think there's an, an easy answer there. My kids shared a room, and I think it was a very, very positive thing. I have a boy and a girl. They're not twins. They're two and three-quarter years apart. My son was in with me until he was about 15 months old. Then uh, we moved him into a crib into his sister's room, and they shared a room for about four or five years until uh, she, as a girl at whatever, eight or something, wanted her own room. So we moved her into uh, a room that we created for her. So, And I just think it was great for their relationship. But that's a little different, you know. She she was nurturing, and she was a couple years older. It's a little different than having the tw two babies in a room together. But yeah, I think like Meg said, you just you have to embrace yeah. the chaos, which is probably easier said than done. But it's the reality of life when you have multiple little ones or twins. Uh, next week we're going to talk about understanding bedtime routines for babies, um, and I think. Um, 
Today's twins webinar is a modification of a webinar we did, uh, I don't know, six or nine months ago on siblings. We included twins, but we talked about siblings. And so that's another good one for when you have children of differing ages, how do you do those bedtime routines? Um, but next week, we're going to specifically talk about bedtime routines for babies, uh, the difference between a nighttime routine and a bedtime routine, and um, how to think about your bedtime routine so that it can gradually begin to reinforce the concept of sleep, um, and um, how to end a bedtime routine routinely <laughs> so that your baby does learn what comes at the very end of the bedtime routine, which hopefully is falling asleep. Um, okay. Everybody have an awesome week. Uh, yes, I see a shout out to my daughter in college. Um, I'm holding up fine. <laughs> I'm texting her a couple of times a day and uh, she's giving me like monosyllabic texts back. Oh. Um, but I haven't heard anything alarming. My daughter, oh. I didn't send her off to college um, or drop her <laughs> no. at college on Sunday, first, first one. Um, Meg, <laughs> that would be an exciting time for you <laughs> in another 10 years. Yep. Um, so have a great week. Happy nurturing. Um, I will see many of you back on Thursday uh, for the breastfeeding webinar and then back again next Tuesday to speak about baby bedtime routines. Meg, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And moms of twins, thank you so much for sending these glorious photos. Uh, they really were wonderful and a delight and a joy to watch come in. And um, there were just too many. That's why I had to put gratuitous slides <laughs> in there.